Thank you, thank you, and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Paco, and welcome to EWTN Live. Tonight we've got a very interesting conversation lined up with Steve Ray, one of our favorites here. He's done lots of great shows uh, for Ignatius Press and for the network. But we'll be talking about a new book of his about the papacy. Before we get to that, I want to talk briefly with EWTN's Director of Online Services, Mr. Jeff Hahn, and about the new look for EWTN.com. Jeff, what kind of new look do you got going there for us? Well, Father, it's our first new look since, um, well, we had a minor upgrade in 2012, and some parts of the website haven't been updated since the early 2000s. Yeah. So a lot of the content that we had that people like, uh, like the d daily readings and devotionals are all still there. Um, but it's all mobile friendly, so you can go on on any device, any size, TV, tablet, whatever, and yeah. it's going gonna, it's gonna to adjust to the screen. That's amazing. And, uh, the, but the documents library is still there? Documents library is still there. Under, so we had a, a section called the faith section, now it's called Catholicism. Okay. So under there you get your daily readings, document library, um, church teachings, prayers, devotionals, litanies, novenas, cool. they're all there. See, I like that because the, the documents library is my favorite. I, it, I bet. So folks can understand. If you, you know, I'll quote the fathers of the church and stuff, but I can get the whole of their text for free. And so can you. Uh, EWTN.com is the name of the website. And there are, plus you can see programs, listen to podcasts, programs, absolutely. radios. Uh, I don't know how to do all that. But I can still read. So, <laughs> so this program will be uploaded to the website tomorrow under the EWTN Live page. So you if go. you miss an episode, you can go there and see it. And that, so the, this is a great, great service. Thanks for keeping us updated on that Absolutely, and updating Father. the website. It's, it's tremendous. I, we get quite a few hits. Of you. We, we get uh, close to 8 million page views a month. Mm -hmm. uh, and watch people watching videos, uh, uh, whether it's on demand or live, we have in the app and actually all together almost two million views a month. Yeah, yeah. so there's, there's a lot going on. There is. All right. Well, thanks, Jeff. Appreciate yes. that. And we'll be back in just a couple minutes with tonight's guest. So please stay with us. Thank you, thank you very much, and welcome back. Our guest tonight is a convert to the Catholic faith, and after coming into the church in 1994, he's been learning a lot more about the faith, but also teaching people all over the world about the wonders of the Catholic faith. He leads pilgrimages uh, to a variety of places, he writes books, and his latest book is pertinent for our times. It's called The Papacy. What? the Pope does and why it matters. So, so please welcome Steve Ray. Steve? Thank you, Father Mitch. I know I can't wear this through the whole show, but I wore it just because there's a lot of people who might not know who I am if I don't have it oh, on. Oh, there you go. All right. Well, there you go without the hat. And it was with yeah. the hat. And it's Good. an honor for me to be here with you. It's I've always great. respected you and your Thank knowledge you. and all that you do. And It's always, always a delight to have you here, too, because you've done some great shows. And, you know, when you've done some of the series for Ignatius Press that was shown here and such, this was... Uh, Sometimes with a lot of fun and, and, and interest. Uh, it wasn't just talking to you. Uh, the, my favorite is you going down the basket out, out of the walls of Damascus. That's pretty good. Um, <laughs> kind of spinny, though. But now you've, you've written this other book on the papacy. 
what what the Pope does and why it matters, that, that, that sounds like a job description. You nailed it. We, you really nailed it. That's exactly what this book is. Uh, as a convert, I had to struggle with the whole idea of authority. I was a Bible only guy. I uh -huh. would have died for that. Yeah. We, I would have cited uh, Martin Luther. I am my own Pope and Council. I don't need Popes and Councils. I'm an Evangelical Protestant and I have the Word of God. Well, when this whole conversion process started, I had to deal with the issue of authority and that's one of the reasons this book came out. Well, why? What's the problem with authority? People tell you what to do all the time, right? <laughs> they did. But my thought was, why should we as Christians, and I don't want to be disrespectful here, but this is the way I used to say it, let some old man in Rome tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. I have the Bible. God's Word speaks to me. That's what He gave us. That's the right. only authority that I need. Well, I okay, need... so you had worked that out. What was your problem then with looking for some authority? Why did you start looking? Well, I, when people ask me, why did you convert? My answer is, it's not because I saw anything good about the Catholic Church. That wasn't what started it. I, I didn't know anything good about the church. To me, I, it was covered with a, a fog of lies and, and misconceptions, caricatures. I never saw the true church. What happened to me, my conversion started when I saw the problems with Protestantism. And what I realized was here I am, my dad was called a church hopper. He went from one church, he'd get in an argument with that pastor, he'd go to another church. He didn't like the way that pastor taught the Bible, he'd go to another. And I kept that tradition up after I got married and was a young man until I was 39 years old. But there comes a point in time where you get tired of that and say, wait a minute, what did Jesus expect the church to be? Why are there 40,000 or however many different denominations? Mm -hmm. I can't even visit all of those to find the right one. And then a friend of mine, a lot of people know who he is, Al Cresta, he's on oh, Catholic yeah. Radio. Him and I had been best buddies for over 10 years. He was a Protestant pastor. One Sunday, without any warning, he said, Steve, my wife and I decided to go back to the Catholic Church. I said, Al, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. You are way too smart to be a Catholic. What in the world are you thinking? When I started to argue with him, my wife and I said, look it, let's study and get ready and we'll convince him he's wrong. But I realized in that process that I was already seeing the problems in Protestantism. And the number one is the fragmentation, the denominationalism, all of these different groups. They all say that they're studying the same book and they all have the same Holy Spirit and they all come up with all these different ideas. So either the Holy Spirit is very confused, which I knew wasn't the case, or else we're going about it wrong. That's what forced me back to the Apostolic Fathers. And I don't even say the Church Fathers. By ap yeah, what do you mean by Apostolic Fathers? So to define to, that. Well, they're the ones that knew the Apostles. They're the ones that are in the first generation. Mm -hmm. These guys... Well, it was St. Polycarp. Polycarp and uh, Ignatius of Antioch and Clement of Rome. These guys, mm -hmm. we even made a movie on them because I say that they twisted my arm and dragged me into the Catholic Church kicking and screaming. I never wanted to be a Catholic. I, and I didn't care what the church father said. Augustine, that gives him three, four hundred years to get all screwed up in my estimation, you know. He, but those pure, pristine Christians that were taught by the apostles, that lived in the first generation, they had to be Protestants. That was my, they had to be, because they couldn't have gotten corrupted with all that Catholic stuff. I'd been taught that that all came in the Middle Ages. I went back, Father Mitch, and I started reading those apostolic fathers honestly, letting them speak for themselves. And I was shocked. They believed in the papacy with the Bishop of Rome from the first century. Clement of Rome, it's obvious from Clement and Ignatius, both first century author, uh, writers. And the more I read the Apostolic Fathers, the more I realized that they didn't have the same source of authority I did. They didn't even have a New Testament put together yet. That wouldn't come for 400 years. And so I asked my friends, how did that first generation of Christians they were killed by lions. They were burned in the flames. They had their heads cut off. And they, they stood strong for Jesus, but they didn't even have the book yet. How did they do that? And the next generations, they fought the heresies. They fought all of these who said Jesus wasn't God and that he didn't have two natures and all the heresies swirling. How did they know how to defend the truth of that without the book? Mm -hmm. And then I started reading in uh, Eusebius' church history too. And I started finding the phrase tradition and bishops, and deposit of faith. And I said, wait a minute, why am I so concerned about what my pastor is telling me today? When I can go back and listen to the very first pastors who knew the apostles. That was my downfall. I say to people, if you don't want to be a Catholic, don't ever read the Apostolic Fathers. Yeah, yeah. On the other hand, <laughs> if you want to understand 
the origins of Christianity, you got to go to the original guys. Absolutely. And you know, the, the, this, uh, how did that though get you to accepting the papacy? Well, I wrote another book earlier than this one called Upon This Rock, and it goes through all mm. of the biblical passages right. in the first eight centuries. And it started out, I found a really cool quote about where Peter is, there is the church. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought, thought that was great. I put it on a on parchment on my computer. I put it up, I was going to put it on. Oh, I found another one. And then I found another one, and pretty soon it wouldn't fit on that, what I was going to frame and put on my wall. And it ended up being that book. I started collecting all, how can, the first centuries, they all understood and accepted the authority of the Bishop of Rome. Yeah. And it was, there was not a wrinkle in that. That was just accepted until much later on during the Protestant revolt. Mm -hmm. And so the whole thing for me is that I have to understand this. I, I'm, people say, why are you a Catholic? Number one reason, because I'm a skeptic. Yeah. And they say, no, if you're a skeptic, you wouldn't be a Catholic. No, 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 I'm a skeptic. I have to have everything proved. I have to know things. I have to have it proved. I'm such a skeptic it, that I ended up being Catholic. And, and stop this, because sometimes people say, well, I'm a skeptic, and they don't accept any proof for what they're skeptical right. about. I mean, th that becomes an impossible situation yep. where you, you know you you have to establish certain criteria that you'll say, okay, if that's the case, then this is true. And that for me was the Bible, but when I then took the Bible and I extrapolated it out to those early Christians. Then I realized how the early church, and my dad told me when I was a boy, follow the truth even if it hurts. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that, mm -hmm. I had to do it even though I didn't want to be a Catholic and we lost our families and we lost every single friend we had in two weeks. Well, our families came back, but the friends never did. Mm -hmm. But I followed the truth and discovering the papacy that from the very beginning there was a teacher and there was a governor who had governed and he taught mm -hmm. and he sanctified along with the other bishops. And all of a sudden that whole structure, not only did I see it as beautiful, but and it has sustained the church for 2000 years, but also it came right out of the roots of Judaism, right out of the Old Testament. It was, a, it was the same flow, the continuity. And here I was today, a Christian, discovering something that's been happening all the way since Moses came down from Mount Sinai. I couldn't wait to get in the Catholic Church. You know, this is uh, something uh, I think that's important in looking at the apostolic fathers. Uh, you know, St. Clement was uh, one of the popes in the 95, and he writes to a church far away in Corinth, in yep. Greece, yeah. and puts them in order. They had kicked all their priests and bishops out because they didn't like them. They didn't like what they taught. And they kicked them out. And he said, no, you can't do that. You have to, and it's a long explanation to, to sway them. And they listened. They and, did it. And he said, as the, as the bishop of Rome, he's speaking as the bishop, if you don't listen to me and the, us and the Holy Spirit, in other words, the Holy Spirit is working through us. If you don't listen to us and the Holy Spirit, you will be in no small sin. Now that's not just an average pastor speaking. This is mm -hmm. someone who has authority over the church. And John, it's presumed that John the Apostle was only 600 miles away from Corinth. Why not appeal to him? He's still a living apostle. Instead, mm -hmm. they're over a thousand miles appealing to Clement. He was Peter, Linus, Cletus, Clement, the yep. fourth. Yep. And they appealed to him to help, help them fix the problem in the Rather church. than the Apostle John, who still is going to be alive yeah. for another and five to ten years. Yeah. yeah. So, so this, this is key. And, and by the way, so folks understand too, when the Catholic Church says we accept that revelation is found in Scripture and tradition, what we mean is the books you're talking about, the apostolic tradition. Right. Not any tradition comes along. It's right. not like, well, Christmas trees are our tradition. Yeah, they are, but that's not authoritative. No. The apostles didn't do that. St. Boniface did. Uh, and so we accept the uh, apostolic tradition that passed on these other teachings and the scripture and that revelation is found in both. So exactly. that's, that's important. Well, I, the way I describe it is when Jesus went up into heaven from the Mount of Olives and he disappeared into the cloud, he didn't stop and say, oh, and by the way, guys, don't forget to read my book. 
I didn't hear that in my Bible. There wasn't a book. Yeah, no, so. and I asked people the Bible only now, what did Jesus leave behind? He left behind 12 men. That's all that he left behind. Those 12 men then went out, and, and one was carrying the keys of the kingdom, and they went out and they taught and they practiced. And the early Christians watched what they did and listened to what they said, and that became the apostolic tradition. And over time, part of that got written down and collected into the New Testament. So it wasn't the New Testament first. That really came last. Yeah. It was first the 12 men, and then the tradition, and finally the book. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that, you know, uh, did you play baseball growing up? Oh, I loved it. Yeah, that right. was my it's, sport. That, that's what we played in my neighborhood all the time. There was an open prairie nearby, and we would go play ball. And one of the the important things is that there are rules for baseball, but in general, you don't let the players decide who's out and who's safe. Am I right? You've got an umpire. You got an umpire. <laughs> and we may not like what he says all the time, but. <laughs> and not only don't we like it, and, and oftentimes the umpire might not be a good ball player, but he knows the rules. Yeah. This is how I yeah. see the, the papacy. I like it. That it's the umpire. Uh, he may not be a great theologian, but he's still the one to say, you're out. Safe. Yep. You know, he needs someone to do that because the players, the theologians, don't do a good job of calling themselves safe. That's where we get to Luther and that. Yeah, exactly. So tell us more about this job description then. Well, what it, the Pope it, does and why it matters. It's what not a. It's not about do? any one Pope. It, right. it is about the, the office. What is the office? How has the Church, based on Scripture and that tradition we're talking about, how did how is that presented to us this office? How does the Pope get elected? Mm -hmm. what, is, what is the job of the Pope? What, where is he infallible and where is he not infallible? Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to do is because when I became Catholic, there wasn't a book like this that I could just pick up and read and kind of get the A to Z's of, yeah. of, the, of yeah. the papacy. And um, I, I want to just mention my, my co-author, Dennis Walters, who's a deacon. And uh, now, and he helped me become a Catholic. When I decided to become Catholic, he was the theologian that worked with me and spent time with me to teach me all things Catholic. I knew the apologetics from the Bible part, but he taught me all the other things. Right. And uh, him and I put this, t wrote this together, an invaluable friend. And one of the reasons is it started out as a, to be a Bible study, but then we realized that it was much more than that. And I wanted people to have a source that they could go to to understand the papacy from scripture, tradition, how a pope gets elected, good popes, bad popes, what the pope does, what his job description is, mm -hmm. all of those things. Sure. So it's a simple, easy to read format with a lot of quotes from the great popes. There you go. Now, in terms of that then, let's take a look. Um, one of the big issues that people have a problem with, not only uh, Protestants, but you know uh, the Eastern Orthodox communities, uh, their, their churches, and uh, even a lot of Catholics, and that is the issue of papal infallibility. And this was not defined until the First Vatican Council in 1870. So. Why should we accept, what is it, and why should we accept it? It's, a lot of times, as you know, things don't get defined until they're first attacked or mm -hmm. challenged. That's exactly right. Everybody understood that the Bishop of Rome from the very beginning was the head of the church and that he had this authority to lead the church, to govern, to teach, and to, to sanctify the church. Even the bishops of the East that had problems would appeal to Rome to help them. So mm -hmm. that was the job. Now, the whole thing of infallibility was when, when Jesus said, I'm giving you the keys, he, he made Peter the prime minister of the kingdom. He gave him authority, but he also gave him a charism of, and, and I think he did this, he had to get in a way, because Peter kind of was loose with his mouth at times and would say things yes. very quickly. And I said that I, that I believe in infallibility from the standpoint that Jesus couldn't just cut Peter loose and say, whatever you say, I'm going to back it up and ratify it in heaven, so go. Mm -hmm. He had to make sure that he somehow superintended Peter and what he said and the, the teaching. So we, uh, we believe that the Holy Spirit superintends and assists the Pope as part of the whole church and the bishops, the church is infallible and the Pope represents that and he has the gift of infallibility, but it's very limited. It's not when he, he in other words, we just talked about baseball. Yeah. The Pope isn't infallible when he predicts the baseball scores next week. No. Or the weather. No. 
That's not his purview. That's not what he does. No. It's it's the uh, charism of infallibility is when it deals with faith and morals, mm -hmm. not history, science, all these other things, but faith and morals relating to our Catholic faith and the morals that we have to follow. And when he is intending to define doctrine as the pastor of the church with his free will without a gun to his head. Right. And when he is doing it um, as it, it, defining something that is already in the deposit of faith, but he's making it clearer or more pronounced. Mm -hmm. Like in 1950, we're celebrating the Assumption of Mary tomorrow. Right. And uh, that bull, that papal bull where he put his seal and he declared that that is a teaching. Not that he just invented, that's what I used to think as a Protestant. See, the Pope, he had nothing to do that day, so he sat down and decided, I'm going to invent a new doctrine. But that I feel <laughs> infallible today. No, no, they don't feel no, infallible. This was done by polling the church and the bishops, and a whole lot of information came in, and then he, from his authority as the Pope and as the uh, as the teacher, prime teacher of the church, he defined this, meaning this is what we've always believed. It's part of the deposit of faith, but now we're going to clarify it and make it uh, a clear doctrine. Mm -hmm. And when he ca all of those factors are involved, then it's an infallible teaching. But other than that, he's not infallible on a day-to-day -day basis when mm -hmm. he's talking to people on a casual basis or when he's uh, predicting t uh, football scores or whatever. So. We have to under, and I think that most people believe that infallibility means that he's perfect somehow, that we think he's perfect, or that he's not sinner, he's not a sinner, that he can yeah, say anything, that, and, and we have to believe everything he says and obey it to a T. Yeah, no, 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 that, that, to be, to say that he's without any sin would be called impeccability, that he's unable to commit a sin, but that's not the claim of the church, no. and, and, you know, there have been, as you mentioned, lots of popes who have been pretty bad. Mm -hmm. And even the good ones go to confession very frequently. Especially the good ones. <laughs> yeah. So the ways they stay good. It's important to keep going to confession. Yeah. John Paul would go every day, you know, and that helped in his sanctity. Um, and so this is something that uh, is very important to distinguish. And not everything that the Pope says, even in faith and morals, is infallible. Right. Uh, but he has to say so, and it has to be to the universal church. Right. It's not something he says, uh, all right, you people in Brazil, like, for instance, 1880, you people in Brazil have to end slavery. Right. You know, uh, th well, that wasn't an infallible statement, but it was a request. Right. And, and it worked, and, and it, it, they yep. ended the last Christian country to have slavery. Yep. So, uh, but that's to a local community. Right. In infallibility, I used to say, well, as a Protestant, well, how can the, the Pope, he's a sinner, and he's a flawed human being like all of us are, so how can he be infallible? It's impossible for, <laughs> but, and then I turn, how, it's impossible for a, fall, a fallible, sinful man to be infallible. Right. And I said, well, wait a minute, who wrote the book of Matthew? Who wrote the book of Mark? who wrote the book of Genesis. These were also infallible men, but even as a they, Protestant. No, they were fallible. Fallible, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. They're fallible men. They're sinful men. And yet, even as a Protestant, I expect, I believe <coughs> that they wrote inspired authoritative scripture. Right. And yet they were sinners. So right. That doesn't stop God. No. Now, there's still one other area, and this is where uh, especially the number of Catholics get into uh, a certain row among themselves. And they say, well, wait a minute. The Pope doesn't make everything infallible. There are just a few infallible statements by the Pope. Um, so I can therefore disregard the rest of his teaching. So Humanae Vitae was, was saying that uh, birth control is forbidden. But he didn't say infallibly, so therefore I don't have to listen to him. Right. What would you say to that? When I was growing up, my father told me a lot of things. There were times where he told me something very strong. That this is what you are going to do, and this is the truth. But there are other times that I had to listen and respect my father, too. He was my father, right. after all. There was a sense of respect and deference to my dad because of who he was. Mm -hmm. When we understand what the papacy is, that Jesus instituted this himself, he said that this is going to be my royal steward who's going to be in charge of my kingdom when I'm in heaven, mm -hmm. and he gives him the keys of that kingdom to be the royal steward then I have to, with great deference and respect for the office, even if I may not agree with everything that, or the, the way things are conducted or what is always said, I still have to 
uh, with great deference and love for the office and for the position, always to give that my respect and my utmost obedience whenever possible. That is the way it, it should be done. And in, in one of the other important things is that you assume that when he's teaching on faith and morals, he's teaching, you know, authoritatively, without it being infallible, right. it's still the ordinary right. magisterium of the Pope. It would be kind of ridiculous to think you only obey him in the extraordinary when he makes these amazing infallible definitions of the faith because then you really don't have to listen to any Pope except maybe every 50 or 60 years when this happens. It doesn't happen so often. No. We are required as a royal steward of a kingdom, the people who live in that kingdom represent, recognize that he represents the king. Right. And that's exactly, we don't live in a democracy. We are in a church which is a kingdom. The king appointed a royal steward. Therefore, when we listen and show deference to that royal steward, we're listening and obeying Jesus. 25 uh, more years before you became a Catholic, I would hear a lot of Catholics complain about Humana Vitae. I don't want the Pope in my bedroom. And I would learn to respond, well, actually, he doesn't want to be there either. <laughs> <laughs> but what he wants is for God to be there. Yeah. And that's what yeah. he was writing about. God is Lord of life and love in that he is the one who has to be the center of yeah. your marriage. And you also place into his hands, you know, whether you have children or not. You know, yeah. it's a, believe me, the Pope doesn't want to be anywhere near your bedroom. <laughs> so uh, don't, don't make false, you know, arguments but deal with the reality and, and, and looking in retrospect on the, uh, uh, the, you know, what happened after Humana Vitae and in culture, he was pretty much right. He was prophetic, wasn't he? Absolutely. That was that, even though Absolutely. even much of the church opposed him at the time. Yep. He was certainly prophetic and uh, yep. we'd be in a different place had we obeyed him. It, 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 to me, it's interesting that some people thought of themselves as being prophetic over against the church when in fact they were being false prophets of the sexual revolution. And Pope Paul VI was telling the truth in the midst of the sexual revolution of the late 60s mm -hmm. and saying this is the, and this is where we have to take a look. Uh, you look back in uh, 1436, Eugene IV was right in condemning slavery. It was an evil and with automatic excommunication. People say, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But he was right. Yeah. And the popes following him in the centuries after were agreed. It's, these are things where we have to be very cautious that we don't just say, well, I'm gonna go with the society and the pope doesn't know what he's talking about. That's, That's a dangerous a position sign. to be in. It yeah. is. Yeah. You're, you're, you're missing something usually. Yeah. So, so this is, uh, uh, this I get, that gets to the issue why it matters. It matters that there's a Pope. Uh, you know, the, one of the points you make in your book is that the Pope then becomes a focus of unity to you, bring the church to move forward together right. and not scatter. You know, I, I've learned from all the time I've spent in the Holy Land, and I know you know this too, that, an, that sheep are pretty dumb animals. Mm. I think that's why Jesus oftentimes refers to us as the sheep of his pasture. Yeah. He knows that we're going to have a tendency like sheep to wander off. And that's why the shepherds have hooks on their staffs. Mm -hmm. And when the sheep wanders off, they take that and they hook him around the neck and they pull him back. And right. sometimes it may hurt and it may not be pleasant and it may even be humiliating and embarrassing, but it saves the life of the sheep. Right. And it keeps the unity of the flock. And I, when Jesus says to Peter in John 21, feed my sheep and tend my lambs, those words feed and tend come from the Old Testament. And feed means to teach, be the proper right. teaching of them. And tend means to govern. Mm -hmm. Those are the two major tasks of the Pope, to tend the sheep. That means to govern them and to keep them as one body. You mm -hmm. don't let the sheep, okay, I'll let you ten go off and you'll be the... Not, not to forget that another job with that staff is to whack the wolves on the head. <laughs> That's absolutely, and the stubborn sheep. <laughs> All right, we have to take a break. 
um, you know, whacking of wolves around here. But uh, uh, we want to get your questions and your comments about the papacy uh, and any questions from our studio audience. So please stay with us and we'll get to you right away. We are ready for some questions. Let's start off with Al. Al, where are you calling from? I'm calling from uh, Pennsylvania. From, Wonderful. Uh, Pl Plains, Pennsylvania, south of Scranton. Okay, great. That uh, in the area. So, uh, what uh, is your question? My question would be for either of you, probably you, Father. Um, when the Pope uh, declares a saint, when he canonizes someone as a saint. Is he speaking ex cathedra uh, uh, from the chair, and is he infallible? I don't think that would go to the level of the chair of infallibility. No, that would be the I think the ordinary, ordinary teaching. right? Where mm -hmm. he uh, he's declaring that based on the information we know on the sanctity of life and so on, that we are convinced that this person is with the Lord in heaven. But right. I don't think it goes to the the level. That's of, right. It's not yeah. infallible. But it's, it is the ordinary teaching right. uh, uh, authority, and it holds great, great weight. It does. You know, uh, it's very, very important. Yep. But also something along that line, too. No pope has ever declared somebody is in hell. Yeah, it's true. They ne yeah. never do that. Not, not Judas Iscariot, not anybody yeah. do yeah. they declare is in hell. Though they can say that certain behavior is hellish behavior. That you can say. Yes. But you can't say, uh, so s making slaves, that's hellish behavior. Aborting babies, hellish behavior. Right. But to say that somebody is in hell, that we leave that up to management to judge, and God is management. That's above our pay scale, no, right? <laughs> it's none of our business. <laughs> I have a question for student. student. Ma'am, where are you from? I live here now in Birmingham, but I'm Great. originally from Michigan. Great. And your question? Well, I have a couple. Um, first of all, I want to know if any popes were martyred for the faith. And second of all, I just love your joy and enthusiasm for the faith. And I want to ask you that when you received your first Holy Communion and your first Holy Confession, what you experienced um, to address the uh, Catholics and the Protestants watching this show, what uh, made that change in your life, what was so special? Do we have another hour, Father? <laughs> no, we don't. You gotta give us the uh, less than readers digest. Okay, real quickly about the popes. I don't know the number of them that were martyrs, but I know that there were, and for the first three centuries, many of them were. Some even estimate that the first 30 popes I, were, may have been. I, I think all but one in the first for, 300 years. First 300 years. Yeah, it was martyred. And was, was martyred. And you know, if you think of it in this standpoint, every one of those men who took the chair of Peter and sat on that chair they had a bullseye on their chest mm -hmm. and they knew that it was very likely they were going to get killed and they accepted that bullseye on their chest and still took the chair anyway. In, um, in modern times uh, certainly uh, there was an assassination attempt on Pope right. Saint Paul VI and Pope John Paul II. Yep. Both uh, John Paul was uh, stabbed and John Paul was famously shot. And I, I think John Paul II didn't die a martyr, but I think that he died as a martyr. I mean, the guy just, he went with his boots on. He went right to the end. Yeah. He never, to me, he, he died a martyr's death because he could have just taken the last five or 10 years in retirement and yeah. he didn't do it. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, quickly too about my first Eucharist and confession. I had, as a Baptist, 
baptism isn't important. Isn't that funny? We call ourselves baptisms, but we didn't think it did anything. Yeah. It wasn't important. Yeah. So I didn't know if I was, I don't remember being baptized. So the priest gave me a conditional baptism, but also I had to hear confession. It took about an hour or two. You know, I was 39 years old and the Lord brought it all back to mind. But I remember walking out of there. I was three feet off the ground for a week. I just, it I couldn't get my feet back on the ground. I felt so good. I had a big F here for forgiven. You know, I just loved that feeling. First time of the Holy Communion, I cried all the way up the aisle. I just cried. And the pastor cried too, because he knew me. And and um, I think the first time, and I know I did this later, the first time I went, he said, body of Christ. I said, thank you. <laughs> And one time on our, on our 10th anniversary, he asked our family to bring the gifts up and I brought, we brought them up and I had the jug of wine and my wife had the bread and our four kids were behind us. We have four kids now, we've got six, 17 grandkids that come when we do this. But anyway, I'm going up and I'm so overwhelmed with emotion that, the, and I'm thinking St. Paul used to persecute the church and now he's, you know, he, God saved, I, and I'm thinking of myself that way, why me? I used, to, I used to call this the cookie Christ. I used to make fun of the Eucharist and here I am coming up with tears of my eyes. I was so overwhelmed with emotion. That was the priest that brought me up. I took off running. I left my family behind. I ran all the way up to the front of the aisle and I hugged him and I said, thanks for letting me be a Catholic. <laughs> and he started crying. My family caught up with me and he said, oh, that was so emotional. But he said, the thing I kept thinking about is where's that jug of wine? <laughs> yeah. But I, I still cry many times when I go up to the Eucharist. We have another question. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. Well, uh, uh, question. Father, Mariano. where are you from? I'm from Maryland, guest priest of the Archdiocese of Washington. Great. Great. Helping serve the Filipino communities in the area. Great. Good for you. Okay. Well, in uh, St. Luke, in the Acts of the Apostles, said that uh, the early Christians were one in prayer, breaking of the bread, fellowship, and especially fidelity to the Apostles' instructions. If fidelity to the Apostles' instructions, Peter is the first among the ranks. So how much more? we have to give to the successor of Peter. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. In the New Testament alone, there is so much evidence for this. When Jesus said to the other uh, disciples that the devil has requested to sift you all as wheat, but you, Peter, I've prayed for you, Peter, not for the rest of you, but you, Peter, that when you come back, when you repent, come back, that you strengthen the brothers. That's an interesting passage, isn't it? That he's, yeah. he says to Peter, I'm going to pray for you because I put you in charge. And when you come back, and I think he's referring to the denial, once yeah. you're back, then I want you to strengthen the rest of your brothers. And, and I think, you know, in John 21, the threefold question you brought up, you know, Peter, do you love me? Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed, feed my sheep. All that that three is to undo yeah. the three denials, but he singles Peter out for reconciliation. We yeah. assume there was a reconciliation for the others who ran away, yeah. Yeah. but he singles out Peter. And make sure in it's in the scripture for the rest of history to know. Because if after they saw him deny Jesus three times in the, at, Cornel, at, at uh, the high priest's house, they're going to say, we're not going to follow you, Peter. You denied the Lord, you know. Well, not gonna, but that's why the Lord then gave Peter a chance three times now to reaffirm right. his love for him and his willingness to feed the sheep and tend the lambs and be the shepherd. So the New Testament's full of this. And I, I oftentimes think, you know, he, he, they'd just been fishing. But they remember when he called Peter, they're fishing in the boat. With, he led a bunch of them back, but they're fishing for fish. And I just sort of often thought, Peter really didn't get the idea of the transition from fishing for fish to fishing for men. <laughs> so now Christ has to use the shepherd to help him get it. Get you know, he, Peter didn't always get stuff first time around. <laughs> you see that often. Sir, where are you from? Uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Welcome. Good to have you here. And what is your question or comment? Uh, first, I wanted to thank Steve for his, his witness. Uh, my wife and I are reverts. We we're both raised Catholic, but we sojourned in the Baptist world for about 13 years. Mm -hmm. And we started having some mm, things. <laughs> and we happened to see you on Journey Home episode, I think it was probably 2011, 2012. And we, it greatly influenced our move back. That makes my heart sing. You yeah. have no idea. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, so my, my question is, uh, I have had conversations about papal infallibility um, with some Protestant friends. Uh, of course, they're all 
a gas that we could even come up with such a thing. Um, but I had read something, I believe it was in uh, Carl Keating's Catholicism and Fundamentalism. And I want to make sure I didn't misquote it and that you would agree it's an appropriate response when you are pressed about it, that the, uh, the idea of the infallibility of the Pope is not that he always gives the right answer, but that the Holy Spirit prevents him from giving a wrong answer. You know, that's actually very, uh, a yep. very key point because the, the charism of infallibility is not a positive charism so much as it is a negative charism. It prevents, for example, I get the imprimatur on this book. It doesn't mean that my bishop liked it or he read it and said, oh, this is very timely. It's well written. I like this. What it means is there's nothing in there that is going to lead someone away from the faith. There's no heresy or things wrong in there. You can read it safely. And in many ways, infallibility is that. It's a negative protection. It keeps mm -hmm. the church and the pope from teaching things outwardly and infallibly as error. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very well done. That's yeah. That that I think it's a that's good an point important to bring thing. up too, which we neglected to. So in, thank you. In, in fact, one of the issues about you know the doctrines of our faith is that oftentimes, uh, in fact, I'd say all the time, we don't really solve the problems of the mystery of the faith. People who figure out and say, oh, I understand the whole mystery of the Trinity now. As soon as they say that, you know they've missed something. You know, uh, our little pea brains cannot comprehend God's infinity. Yeah. What we can say, though, uh, safely, is no, that's not correct. You haven't solved it. And, uh, or, more typically what happens is you accept one part of the mystery and use that one part you get to get rid of the other parts of the mystery. Yeah. So there's only one God. Yeah, I get that. That's great. So Jesus isn't God. That's the Jehovah's Witness answer. Right. The Catholic answer is no, there's one God, but it's three persons. Yeah. And, you, and the papal infallibility would say, you cannot deny the oneness of God. Yep. There's not three gods. And you cannot deny the threeness of persons. Yep. So there's one what, three who's. I but, remember, I remember, but, that, but that's all you can say. I remember you saying one time, and I liked it, and I've used it. I hope you don't mind, that you said the whole Old Testament is trying to get the people of Israel to understand there's one God. Yeah. And then at the end of the Old Testament, God takes a deep breath, and he says, okay, now I want you to to understand that that one God is three persons. Right, right, <laughs> was, right. That, that, I've used that a lot. Good, well, it's, I, I think it's, you know. It, it really helps, and I, I love also the whole idea of understanding and getting the, uh, I fully understand the Trinity ideas, is that story of, of Augustine when he was meditating on the Trinity on the beach and a little boy had dug the hole and he was taking all the water from the ocean and putting it in his hole, remember right. that story? Mm -hmm. And Augustine said, what are you doing, little boy? He said, I'm gonna take all the water in the ocean and put it in my little hole. And Augustine says, sir, you little boy, look at the, the ocean is vast and infinite. You can't put all of that water in your little hole. And the boy stood up and pointed and said, and neither will you, sir, get all of the vast, infinite knowledge and mystery of God in your little head. Yep. I remember that story. I think the sisters told me that in seventh grade or something. <laughs> That's why I remember it, because I'm still a kid at heart. <laughs> Let's go to Tom. Tom, where are you calling from? Brooklyn, New York. Great. Welcome. And your question? I have two, if I may. All uh, right. When uh, Pope Paul issued the Humanae Vitae, uh, prior to that, well, Catholic people who may have been practicing birth control, will they be uh, committing mortal sin? Okay. okay. And number two, uh, when the Pope does issue uh, an infallible doctrine, does he have to consult with the, the cardinals before this issue is made? And I'll hang up and uh, listen for your answer. Thank you for taking my call. Oh, Tom, we're delighted. Thank you, Thank for, you calling. for calling. I'll, I'll take the first and may you take right. the second. Um, I know that the church from the very beginning considered, although it's not mentioned in the Bible, but that's where it comes in this wonderful thing of tradition, is right from the beginning the church said that contraception and abortion is a sin, right yeah. from the beginning. And, 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 that, and just so folks can look, you know, go to, I mentioned before, the um, website with the uh, church documents and, and the fathers of the church. Yep. You can go to the Didache, and that forbids uh, some. The word that's used 
for birth control is pharmakeia. Sometimes it's translated as sorcery, but it may well be in that context, pharmakeia, we would get pharmacy from. Yeah. And then also in the uh, letter of Barnabas, I believe it's in chapter 8, you'll see it there it as well. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament, to Genesis. I'm writing a commentary on Genesis right now, and all the way back to the sin of Onan, who refused. He, he was trying to do birth control right back, all the way back there, and God That's killed right. him for it. Yeah, that, that didn't sound like God had liked it. No, God so, didn't like that. So it's, but in other words, the, the Pope uh, did not come up with a new idea and teach it about contraceptive. That was something that has been understood and taught in the church from the very beginning. As a matter of fact, all the fathers who mention either abortion or birth control condemn it. Right. So did Martin Luther. Yep. So did John Calvin. They agreed with that. Yep. Uh, this was not something that the Pope started. He reaffirmed this doctrine in the face of the invention of the birth control right. pill. Right. That's why it, it, they did the encyclical. The pill was meant, it was invented so that Catholics, uh, there was a Mrs. McCormick who inherited a lot of money uh, from the McCormick's, I think, of Chicago. Um, I think they made the uh, farm machinery. But at any rate, they, uh, she donated her money to a Harvard professor to invent this so Catholics could do birth control because the head of uh, Planned Parenthood wanted Catholics to find a legitimate way. And that's why this came up. Yep. But birth control had been uh, condemned long before. All along. And then and something, uh, uh, the, the second question that he had um, was about the, uh, the, the, I forget now, the, the, but the second question was, do you remember? I don't remember. I, it's, I was so intense on answering yeah, this I one. Yeah, I know. Uh, uh, it's, um, but it, it, well, it slipped my rate. mind. Yeah, maybe we'll come back. See, this is, oh, wait, oh here it is. It's, uh, does the Pope, oh, need to consult with the Cardinals yes, yes, yes. to decree something infallible? I, I don't think he needs to do that, but he does. That's right. I it's think not it's, necessary. No, and I think that he realizes as well that it would. it's much wiser, and he is not a sole person. He is a part of a college of, of cardinals right. and bishops, and he knows that there's a census fidelium, the sense of the faith, and he wants to get the sense of the faithful. These po folks sitting here are the census fidelium, what they believe the simple. Sometimes the sheep are very smart. I've said they're dumb, mm -hmm. but sometimes they are smarter than the shepherds at times. So I think that that's a wise thing, and I think the Pope utilizes it. Yeah, both with the dec the infallible decree of the Immaculate Conception and of the Assumption the bishops of the whole world were consulted and they were told to consult the laity right. and get the census right. uh, for them, the, the sense of the people. Be, the principle is the Holy Spirit could, would not allow the whole body of Christ to be deceived exactly. on a particular right. thing. So that's what's going Good. on. So uh, let's go to another caller. Joe? Yes, how are you? Fine, where are you from? I'm from Middletown, Connecticut. Great, welcome. And your question? Okay, can a current pope reverse an infallible decree of a prior pope? No. No. Nope. And, no, and, that's, that, and that's an interesting point because every pope that comes along is more constrained than the pope before him because as one pope defines something in teaching, the, other, the next pope has to take into account what that that's right. Earlier Pope said. So there each successive Pope is actually in some ways more constrained than the one before him because he has to stay within the true and uh, teaching of the church and the tradition. And Pope St. John Paul had dealt with this question in a certain way. He emphasized, uh, because he's dealing with a lot of ecumenical issues and he was especially working with the Eastern uh, Orthodox uh, churches. Uh, these are churches that have the, the pre valid priesthood, valid bishops, seven valid sacraments. You know, we recognize that fully um, and, and know that they're, they're valid in, in those things. But the issue of the papacy is one of the concerns. And he emphasized that the Pope is a servant of the deposit of faith. 
not yeah. its master. Mm -hmm. He is not in control of, what, of the Bible. He's a servant of the Bible. He's not in control of apostolic tradition. He's a servant right. of the tradition. The caretaker, And yeah. it's his, yeah. like an umpire. Yeah. An umpire does not make up the rule book for baseball. Right. He has to follow it and interpret specific events in that light. Yep. Now, here's, here's a question I, I, uh, that I think would be worth taking a look at. If a pope you know, says something heretical, what can happen to him? He can be condemned by a council as being a heretic. Yeah. Because Pope Honorius did that. Yes. We have a pope who did that. He didn't teach anything officially wrong, but in a private correspondence. A letter. A letter, a private correspondence, a letter, he did espouse a heresy. It's a wrong conception of Christ and the two natures. Right. And yeah. so. He, he, he was dealing with a, a bit of theology that was too refined for him. Yeah. He didn't have the background. Right. Just because a pope is a pope doesn't mean he's a genius. That's right. Yeah. And it, 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 he, there was a heresy called monothelitism, right. that Christ only had a divine will and did not have a human will. Yeah. And, that, and he didn't understand the question. That was one of his problems. Yeah. He did not understand the yeah. issue. But he didn't and he sit made in, a mis and he was but he didn't incorrect. sit on the chair and say that that's what everyone had to believe. Right. He didn't define it that way. That's he was right. just a, a pr private correspondence. Because of that, later he was uh, declared to be a heretic, and yet he had counsel. never, but he had still been an infallible pope in the way infallibility applies. Right. All right. We have uh, this book, again, you get it from our catalog. It's pap The Papacy. What the Pope Does and Why It Matters by Steve Ray at EWTNRC.com. It's item number 2169. Love for you to get that. Love, thank you thank very you. much for being here with us. And I want to give you all a blessing. May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you and lead you in all of your ways by His peace. God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You know, we can have Steve here and all the other guests who do programs only because this network is brought to you by you. Mother Angelica felt inspired by our Lord to not sell advertising or anything like that, but to let you bring this network to you. So, especially in these summer months when a lot of people are on vacation, we ask you and remind you to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and cable bill. Our bill collectors do not take a vacation. So please help us out. God bless you and thank you.